You have to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit's leadership in your life uh, in preaching. And the main thing is you've got to have the unction of God on your preaching. You've got to preach from, from a heart. You can get on the Internet. When I was growing up, every preacher, I guess, back during my younger days, every preacher had a library full of uh, Herschel Ford's Sermons on this, sermons on... He must have had 50 different books of sermon outlines, 50 sermon outlines for a funeral, 50 sermon outlines on uh, love, 50 sermon outlines on whatever. And, uh, you know, I've tried to use those things. I can't, I just cannot ever preach just an outline like that. Uh, it's got to be something that's hot on your heart, something that uh, that God's you know God's anointing is on it, or it's just going to be a speech. That's all it's going to be. Now you can get up and make a speech, but it's not going to move anybody or bless anybody. It's just a speech. Doesn't have any. The power of God's not on it. It doesn't. There's just something about preaching that that uh, when, when you're preaching with uh, when you're when when you're uh, under the unction of God and the Holy Spirit's on it. Uh, it's different from any other kind of speaking. <clears throat> and uh, talking about being called to preach, God called you to preach. If he'd have wanted another Billy Graham, he'd have made another Billy Graham. He doesn't call you to be Billy Graham. He calls you to be you. And one of the one of the problems a lot of pre young preachers have is when they get started preaching, they've got a favorite or two or three favorites that they've seen on TV or somebody that they heard way in a tent revival somewhere that could really preach and all that stuff, you know. And they, so they've got two or three favorites, so they'll try to be like them. Well, God didn't call you to be them. If he'd called wanted another one of them, he'd have just made another one of them. He called you to use your own particular gifts and talents and personality and, 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 and be you. This fellow in my church down in Alabama used to tell about when he was a little boy. They had some famous preacher came to town there around Athens way back years ago. I mean, he was known all over the South. Tremendous preacher, great preacher, great pulpiteer. People flocked to hear him. And he said, my grandma took me to a meeting one night to hear him. And said, man, he preached, he preached, he sweated, he jerked his coat off and threw it over here, and he, he uh, got his tie all loosened up, and he sweat all the way through his shirt and all that, and boy, he was really going, and Oh, man, what a pulpiteer. Said, we left that night, and Grandma said, Oh, that man can preach. Oh, can't that man preach? Bobby said, What did he say, Grandma? Well, I don't know what he said, but he sure can preach. You know, not much good if they don't know what you say, is it? And uh, back when I was a boy, Everybody wanted to be like Billy Graham. They'd learn to talk like Billy Graham. They'd even fold their Bible around and carry it like Billy Graham always did. You know, he'd open it up and turn the cover around backwards and hold it in one hand and preach, and they'd do their Bible like that. And a lot of people, uh, still you'll hear preachers every once in a while that have some of the uh, voice inflections and so forth of Adrian Rogers. Adrian had a way of having a little chuckle somewhere along. So every once in a while, you'll hear four or five times during their sermon, they'll go, <laughs> like Adrian used to do in some of his messages. I just watched a great sermon on TV a while ago, him preaching on Christians, Christianity, and the, and the church and government. Really good. But uh, one, of the, uh, one of the hardest things that I've ever one of the most difficult things for me all down through the years has been uh, 
knowing what to preach, deciding what to preach. And, uh, you know, how do you do that? Prayerful Bible reading, prayerful Bible study, sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. As you read through the Bible, oftentimes something will just grab you. I mean, the Holy Spirit will just get a hold of you with a passage or a verse or something you read in there. And you just, you, know, you, just, you just realize, you know, God's speaking to you about that. That's something that you uh, need to read and study and take a look at. And that's, that's sermon material right there. I used to keep a notepad by my bed. Sometimes I'd wake up in the night. And I'd get some kind of something on my mind or something on my heart and think, man, that, that's something I need to get up a sermon on one of these days. So I'd just kind of jot that down because if I didn't, I wouldn't remember what it was the next morning when I woke up. And uh, oftentimes there are things like that. I always think it's good to listen to a lot of preaching for a lot of reasons. One is you see how folks do it. I mean, Good preaching. Uh, this afternoon, I went home after I heard a tremendous sermon here this morning. Went home and listened to David Jeremiah and then listened to Adrian Rogers. And uh, both guys that you can, they're, they're sound, solid, you can learn some things from them. And oftentimes, listening to a sermon or hearing somebody preach a sermon, God will just grab my heart about something in there. And uh, something that I'll want to go get up a sermon on. It's, it'll spark my just you know spark my thinking, and and uh, just get uh, just get my soul lit up about a particular thing uh, that I've heard that I want to go work on. And sometimes I've had those things that sometimes it'd be three or four years before I'd ever be able to. I think timing's involved in some of these things too. Sometimes I'd have that on my mind three or four years and I'd start on it and just never would quite come together. And then finally one day I'll sit down and man, it just all starts falling into place and comes together <coughs> really well. But, uh, you know, the problem with just looking on the internet and finding an outline is if it's not hot on your heart, it's not going to mean much to anybody else either. Used to be an old preacher. I guess he's still around here. Preacher named Obi Campbell. You remember Obi? Somebody asked Obi one time, said, Obi, who's your favorite preacher? Obi thought a minute. He said, Well, you know, when I'm really on, I'd just about rather hear me as anybody. And of course, that's humorous, but at the same time, if you don't think it's any good, nobody else is either. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, I mean, if you're up trying to preach something, you think this thing, this is no good. Uh, most of the time, nobody else is going to think it's any good either. And uh, it needs to be something that's hot on your heart that you're excited about, and and, and uh, you've done your best. <clears throat> I'm like, you know, I guess everybody likes some of that. I, I uh, have always. You can't do it here because there's too many doors, but I'd always go stand at the door after preaching and people come out and tell me they enjoyed the sermon or good sermon today or whatever. And, you know, I like that stuff. I, I don't have to have a lot of that, but, uh, you know, 10 or 12 people ever serve us fine enough. But anyway, anyway it's, uh, I don't really need a lot of that because I'm going to tell you something. When I step down out of the pulpit, I know whether it's any good or not. And if the Lord's pleased with it, doesn't much matter. And I know whether it's something that I feel like God was pleased with or not pleased with. So that's something that's going to be uh, probably you'll face. Preaching occasionally, it's not going to be so much as, you know, about trying to decide what to preach on. But uh, if you're having to get up three sermons a week, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, 
you know, it can get to be uh, a task. You really need to know before Saturday what you're going to preach on on Sunday. Uh, another thing, too, you get something on your mind, something on your heart. I had a preacher friend down in Benton had uh, four uncles that were all preachers. His daddy was the only one of five brothers that wasn't a preacher. He said, my daddy always said, the only reason God called me to preach is because he wouldn't. But he said, I was talking to one of my uncles one day and I said, well, I, he knew I was supposed to preach somewhere Sunday. And he said, well, you got anything on your mind for Sunday? Yeah, yeah, I've got, uh, I've got two or three things on my mind. Huh. I'd rather get up to preach with nothing on my mind. It's two or three different ones. And uh, those of us who do it know that feeling. Uh, you just have to try to be sensitive to the Lord's leadership. I've gotten up before, and once I got started, realized I probably preached the wrong sermon that day. You know, I'd had two or three on my mind. I never have had the nerve to just quit and go do the other one. I just go ahead and finish it. But uh, usually it takes a lot of your time knowing what to preach. And uh, I'll pass on a couple of things that I learned in preaching class that I took in doing my doctorate. Was uh, One of them was... Uh, our preaching professor said, just two things I want you guys to remember. If you don't remember but two things out of this whole class, remember these two things. One is, you ain't Charles Stanley. Charles Stanley might can hold people spellbound for an hour, but you can't. And the second one is, the Holy Spirit works on Monday just as well as he does on Saturday night. You don't have to wait till Saturday night to start working on a sermon. Holy Spirit's working on Monday. Uh, if you get to pastoring one of these days, the Lord opens up something, puts you in a position where you're having to get up something regularly. Two or three little things I'll talk to you about, uh, to suggest to you. One of the things that really helps is preaching through books of the Bible. And there again, you need to be sensitive to the Lord's leadership and guidance and really pray about it and, and prayerfully uh, ask God to help you know which book to, pre to select to preach through and seek His leadership and guidance on that. Don't just, you know, there used to be an old thing about uh, some of these old-timey preachers. They'd get up in the chair up in the pulpit Sunday morning while the song service was going on, they'd bow their head. Then they'd start flipping through their Bible and they'd flip, and then they'd flip some more and they'd flip some more and then they got through. That's it. So that's how much preparation they had done right there. Uh, I suggest to you, if you're going to preach, ever preach through a book, pick a short one. First John, Philippians, some of those. Nobody, nobody wants to hear a three-year series on the Gospel of Matthew. And, uh, and it's good, even the situation, you know, even if you're not preaching regularly, it's always good to stay a couple of weeks ahead in your preparation. Uh, you know, it may come the week you're supposed to go preach, so you, know, you may have all kinds of things happen. Uh, your car might tear up, uh, air conditioner may quit on you. you no telling, you may have two or three doctor's appointments that you didn't plan. All kinds of things can happen, so try to stay ahead so that if you find yourself in a situation you're pressed for time, you've already studied, and all you need to do is kind of review a little bit and get back, uh, get back uh, tuned in to what you were going to preach. I can't get a sermon up too far ahead because I lose interest in it by the time I ever get to it, if I do that. You know, that thing about where it's hot on your heart today, next month it may not be hot on my heart then like it is now. So I can't do that very much ahead of time. 
but try to do it a little ahead of time. When I was a young preacher just starting out, it was pretty customary. If you went and visited in a church somewhere and the pastor found out you were a preacher, you were going to preach that day. So you better have a couple of sermons in your Bible ready because you were probably going to be invited to preach if you visited the church somewhere and the preacher found out you were a preacher. I don't know if they all wanted to get out, get out of preaching that bad or what, but uh, where, they didn't, where they could use next, this Sunday sermon next Sunday or what the deal was. But, but uh, you were probably going to be invited to, to preach uh, next Sunday. Just uh, another little thing, a suggestion. Oh, people today preaching blue jeans and golf shirts and whatever, you know. It's not uncommon. It's probably more common than not uh, today. But I want to tell you something, and you can do what you want to of this. But just think about it. When I go to town and go into a store, if I've got on a shirt and tie like this, I get treated a whole lot differently than I do if I go in there in my fly fishing clothes. You want people to listen to you. So do everything you can that encourages them to do that. Oh. Uh, how do, you, how do you go about, once you've decided on what you're going to preach, you know, we want to be a Bible preacher, don't we? I mean, that's what God called us to do, was preach the Bible. And uh, oftentimes, once you get to pastor, if you ever do, if you ever take a church to pastor, you'll find out you've got a whole lot of other things competing for your time. You've got hospital visits and shut-ins and meetings and associational meetings and everything in the world competing for your time. But uh, just keep in mind the main thing God called you to do is preach. So guard that time. Guard study time. That's the main thing. That's what God called you to do was preach. Uh, now He calls you to do all these other things too that are part of the pastor. But the main thing is preaching. Focus on that. Be sure you get that right. Uh, when you get when you do have a text selected, what do you do? First thing you don't do is open a commentary. Don't ever open a commentary first. Uh, we use commentaries last, not first. And keep in mind, if we're going to be a Bible preacher, you, there are all kinds of sermons. We've got what we call, uh, you know, like springboard sermons or diving board sermons. And you've heard those where a guy gets up and reads a passage of Scripture and jumps off of it and goes off in some direction and never comes back to that passage of Scripture. You just use that for a springboard to jump off into something else, bounce off into something else. And uh, they, uh, we're not here to, we're not here to, uh, people don't need to know what I think. They need to know what God says. And that's, that's our primary thing, is to tell people what God says in His book. And here again, let the Bible speak. When you get ready to study, let the Bible say what it says. You know, a lot of guys will get up a whole sermon and then go try to find a scripture that goes with it somewhere. That's not Bible preaching. That's what you thought. 
and then you just got a sermon, you just found a passage of scripture to use to hang all your thoughts on. It may or may not even have anything to do with your sermon. Don't try to make the Bible say something it doesn't say. And oftentimes we go into the Bible, we go into our Bible study, go into studying our passage with our mind already made up what it says. Let it say what it says. And you know, the Bible's not in code. It's not like you have to crack some code to understand it. Most of the time, the Bible just means just what it says. Now, it uses, you know, hyperbole and parables and all kinds of different things to, illust to illustrate a particular point. And we have to understand those things. But let the Bible say what it says. And there's a danger in what we call proof texting, where you make a statement and then you read about four or five verses to support the statement that you made. There was an old preacher up in Virginia. I was just getting started preaching and they'd have me come over to their First Baptist Church, Damascus, Virginia and preach every other Sunday. They wanted me to preach every Sunday, but I was already committed to another church. I'd gone up there to preach one Sunday and uh, First Baptist Damascus called me and said, can you come over here and preach next Sunday? And I said, no, but I can come the next one. Okay, come the next one. Well, I finished at that first one. They said, can you come back next Sunday? No, I can come the next one. I'm, so I spent three or four months, probably just every other Sunday between those two churches preaching. But there's an old retired preacher way up in his 80s, Pop Trivet, told me one day, he said, uh, I preached one Sunday. I mean, I preached up a storm one Sunday. We got through. We were hanging out over at his, some of his people's house that afternoon. He said, I believe you might make a pretty good preacher one of these days. I thought I already was one. <laughs> but anyway, he said, let me tell you something. I can take the Bible and prove that you're a first cousin to a groundhog. And he went through a bunch of passage verses and did. You know, this turn to this verse, turn to that verse. I wish I'd written that all down. That would have been so useful to me down through the years, but I didn't write it down, and he's dead and gone now. But, uh, you know, if you do a lot of that proof texting, you can about make the Bible say whatever you want it to say if you take verses out of context and everything else and just put them. It can be very dangerous. Proof texting can be dangerous. Don't mean don't ever do it, but it, be careful when you do it. And a running commentary, what we call a running commentary, can be very effective method of preaching. Jamie grew up on that, where you read a verse and preach it. Read the next verse and preach on 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 it. That's the only way Homer Lindsay pastored that big old First Baptist Church in Jacksonville ever preached, I reckon. And that's a very effective, except many, many times it's an excuse for not studying. You just read a verse and whatever pops in your head, say it. And when you're done, read the next one, whatever pops in your head, say it. And watch the clock and whenever it comes time to stop, just stop right there, whatever verse you did last and it can be a real effective preaching method but it can also be a, a an excuse and a cover up for not having studied much I pastored Elkton Road Baptist Church down there as a bivocational pre well I prep pastored New Bethel for about a year and then Elkton Road for a couple of years I probably spent about three years as a bivocational pastor. And that is hard work. Because you really want to do as good a job as a full-time guy does. But you've got a 40-hour, 50-hour job that you have to do. You've got a family to take care of. And, uh, and you still got to get up three sermons a week. And it's pretty hard, pretty difficult, pretty taxing on you 
Uh, but I'll tell you, we've got an awful lot of churches here in Blount County that uh, have 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 people going to church there, and they need a preacher too, but they can't afford somebody full time. But they need a preacher. And, and there's just a, down in Polk County when I pastored down there, I think we had 34 churches in our association. Only seven of us were full-time preachers. The rest were bivocational guys. Churches were small. What do you do with the verse? You, the passage you've selected. First thing you need to do is read the verses before that passage and the verses after that passage. Kind of get it in context. Look at the verses before it, what do they say? Look at the verses after it, what do they say? And that helps you understand what's in the middle a little better sometimes. Once you've chosen a text, read it in several different translations. I mean, if you can afford it, keep four or five different translations of the Bible and see how each one of those translate that passage that you're looking at. There's a lot of controversy about it and a lot of people uh, really don't like it. But I've got an amplified Bible that I like that I've found helpful over the years. Don't put too much stock in it. <laughs> but, but it's helpful in uh, explaining some things sometimes. Take a look at the book that you're preaching from. Let's say you're preaching from John. Uh, what's the main theme of the book where your text occurs? What's the main theme of the Gospel of John? Well, one thing about John's writings, and Scott's pointed this out, one easy thing about John's writings is John tells you why he wrote it. And uh, so you can, <laughs> you can find that easy enough because he tells you. These things have I written that you might believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through His name. John's the Gospel of Belief. Who's the human author? That can help you. When is it written? To whom was it written? What were the conditions existing? Many of the... <laughs> this, almost all of the epistles are written to correct some problem in the church. Uh, whether they're fighting the Gnostics or the Judaizers or whoever it might be, or immorality of 1 Corinthians or whatever. But that can be helpful as you look at what that text is saying. What were the circumstances? What were the conditions? What was going on at the time? Those things can be helpful to you. Once you've done all that, Once you've done all that, what time we get through? 5.45? Once you've done all that, go back and look at your text. Get you a piece of paper. And I believe in pieces of paper. So, so keep you, as you can see, keep you something like this to write on. Now these are things I jotted down three or four years ago. It hasn't got anything to do with what we're doing today. But uh, uh, look for key words and key phrases as you go through that text. And as you go through the Gospel of John, what kind of key words are you going to see a lot? Believe, light, the Word, and uh, signs. 
So whatever key words or key phrases are there, write those down. And uh, once you get those key words written down, that you know, you may have a word that appears six or seven times. So you've got five verses. You may have one word that's used six or seven times in those five verses. Well, write it down. Or a key phrase that appears there and maybe in the passage before and the passage after. Write it down. Key words and key phrases. Write them down. And then look up the meanings. What do those words mean? And here's where some good tool books can help you. And I still say books. I realize all this is available online now. <laughs> books are pretty much obsolete. I don't know why we even need libraries anymore except to store old copies of old books, maybe. I don't know. But, uh, but I don't use libraries. I don't use the Internet much. I still use books. Uh, and uh, next week I'll try to have some of those in here for you to look at. You may be familiar with uh, Vine's uh, Dictionary of New Testament Words. I found very helpful. Uh, a Strong's Concordance. I don't use a Strong's. I use a Young's. I wish I'd have bought a Strong's, but I didn't. Uh, the Strong. They all have numbers and. Then I, I do have a keyword study Bible, uh, Spiros Zodiades. And as it goes through, it's got study notes, but it also, all of the key words have a concordance number in the Strong's Concordance. Then in the back, it's got a Strong's Concordance, not the whole thing, but you can look in the back and see what the Strong's Concordance thing has to say about how that word's used other places it's used. What does it mean when it's used somewhere else as opposed to when it's used here? Uh, things like that. And uh, once you've done those things, uh, that's probably a pretty good place for us to stop tonight. And uh, I'm going to I'm going to go on from there about what you do now, but I don't want to quit in the middle of that, so we'll just save the rest of that till next week. That's one thing, by the way, that you'll find if you decide to preach through a book of the Bible. You're going to have some passages that are shorter. I mean, you know, you're going to have sermons that are shorter and sermons that are longer because this passage just doesn't take as long to preach on as this passage. So, here's, uh, I'll come back to this, but let me go ahead and share this with you. A couple of things. Don't preach too long. That's what uh, my preaching professor was trying to tell us when he told us we weren't Charles Stanley and we couldn't hold people spellbound for an hour. And uh, the older I get, the shorter my attention span gets, too. I <laughs> but, uh, and then you finish and look up, and you ain't been going but 15 minutes. Well, that's fine. You're through. You don't have to go back and preach it the second time just to fill up. Don't add a bunch of filler just to make it last longer. You know what I mean? Don't, don't, don't go back and just keep adding this and adding that and adding that because, well, I ain't been going but 15 minutes. I need to go at least 25, so I'm just going to add this and this and this and this to make it till it comes out to 25. Don't add a bunch of filler. When you're through, you're through. And uh, if you see it's going to run too long, you know, this is, this is a good general rule, I think, that most preachers would probably tell you. When you start out preaching, it's hard to get enough stuff to go 25 or 30 minutes. Aren't you been doing it a long time? It's hard to cut out enough stuff to cut it to 25 or 30 minutes. So, uh, uh, I had uh, 
Henry Lingenfelter's cousin of mine, Scott's full-time evangelist all his life, preached revivals all over the country. And he told me, he said, I, found, I discovered over the years if I'd keep a sermon to no more than 30 minutes, I'd have a lot more decisions. People quit listening after a certain point in time. So uh, I've had people over the years say to me, I'm sure Scott has, well, man, I wish you just kept going. I was really, I was loving that. I wish you just kept on. I always reply this way. I always try to quit before you do. And that's a pretty good piece of advice, I think. Quit before they do, and you can tell when you've lost them. Well, have you got any questions about anything we've talked about tonight? Or?